the books that I'm going to show, this one I'm actually going to read from, but I want to show the book in its lovely state. And it is an 1849 oh, wow. yearbook of Godey's Ladies book. Mm. And I, I want to be able to show the Let's see if I can get a close there. Yeah. And it's my prized possession. There is a poem that I'm sure you all know. And it's called Mary Had a Little Lamb. There are lots of things about this poem that I bet you don't know. It's usually called a mother goose poem. You know, one of those, those uh, Jack and Jill went up the hill poems. Things that usually don't have an author attributed to it. This one does, and her name is right here, Sarah Josepha Hale. Mm. Sarah Hale lived in Newport, New Hampshire. I have known about her for many years because I too was from New Hampshire. Sarah was a school teacher, a milliner. There's a good word for you. Do you know what a milliner is? It's a person who makes hats. And she was a writer. She had five children, she and her husband. And unfortunately, her husband, Mr. Hale, passed away and left Sarah with the five children to figure out how to take care of them. Now Sarah had a dad who lived in the same town and she and the children moved into his farm um, so that they would have a less expensive place to live and she started teaching at the little one-room school in her town and that's where she wrote the poem in, uh, well it was published in 1830, she wrote it a few years before that called Mary Had a Little Lamb. In her poem, as you know, there was a girl named Mary and huh, a little lamb there. I don't know, can you see this? And what happened was uh, the lamb who had fleece you know, his fur, his wool, as white as snow, followed Mary. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. You know that, right? And you know the part that says, it followed her to school one day. It was against the rule. It made the children laugh and play to see a lamb in school, and I bet that that's very true. It would be funny to have a little lamb in school. I would like it a lot. I used to have lambs. <sighs> and here's all the children laughing and playing and hugging the lamb, not tending to their studies. And when children don't tend to their studies, what happens? And so, the teacher turned it out, put it outside. It was too distracting. But still, it lingered near and waited patiently about. Why do you think? He was waiting patiently about till Mary did appear. Why does the lamb love Mary so? The eager children cried. But why do you think? Why, why would the lamb love Mary so much? It would wait all day outside the school for her to come out. Why Mary loves the lamb, you know, the teacher did reply. And that's the end of what you know as Mary had a little lamb. 
But the original Mary Had a Little Lamb was longer. It had another verse after that. This is the original Mary's Lamb, and I do not have a picture of Mary's Lamb of the original. But there is an attachment somewhere here that has this poem on it. And with that is a picture of a book by an illustrator, I assume you know, Tommy DiPaolo. And uh, the, this book has the whole poem and wonderful illustrations. And I strongly recommend it. Our library does not have it here in gray, but it is going to. Mary's Lamb, and that was the original title. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. He followed her to school one day. Hat was against the rule. It made the children laugh and play to see a lamb at school, and so the teacher turned him out. But still, he lingered near and waited patiently about till Mary did appear. And then he ran to her and laid his head up on her arm, as if he said, I'm not afraid. You'll keep me from all harm. What makes the lamb love Mary so? The eager children cry. Oh, Mary loves the lamb, you know, the teacher did reply. And you, each gentle animal in confidence may bind and make them follow at your call if you are always kind. And that's the full story of Mary's Little Lamb. And I think without the ending, it's not nearly as interesting. The ending says, if we are kind to animals, and people that we will have friends in both animals and people. And that's as simple as it can be and as wonderful as it can be about being kind to one another, kind to animals, just plain kind all the time. And that's what Mrs. Hale wanted people to get out of her poem, and for that reason, um, I am opposed to shortening the poem. <laughs> but you know, um, try to get a hold of the real one. Well, I'm sending you the real one, and read it. And the, the part in it, um, and you, each gentle animal, in confidence may bind. That's kind of a, uh, a difficult way of saying. Um, um, it, you know what confidence is. It, 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 you can, you can have faith. You can have confidence. You can be sure that um, if you are kind, the animals will follow you. People will follow you. You will have friends if you are kind. And that's my story of Mary had a little lamb. But it's only the beginning of my story about Sarah Josepha Hale. Why would I choose Mary's Lamb as a Thanksgiving uh, poem or story? Because the woman who is responsible for Thanksgiving being a national holiday is none other than that same woman who wrote Mary's Lamb. And it started like this. She wrote a book and around 1947, I think, called Northwood. And in it, she kind of explored American holidays and traditions and came to the conclusion that America needed another holiday, something on the scale of the 4th of July, something that would bring people together. And so she thought Thanksgiving would be the ideal type of holiday. This book, called Thank You, Sarah, and written by Lori Halls Anderson and illustrated by Matt Faulkner. 
This is in the library in gray, and I strongly recommend your getting it. I don't know if I'm being too bouncy here. Okay. You think you know everything about Thanksgiving, don't you? How the natives saved the pilgrims from starving. And here we have the picture of everybody sitting down. They're eating corn on the cob, which they might not have had. Uh, they're probably eating turkey, which they did not have. If they're eating sweet potatoes, we didn't have any sweet potatoes either. Funny how those things happen. Um, how the pilgrims held a big feast to celebrate and say thank you. Turkey, pumpkin pie, cranberries, the works. Well, they probably did have pumpkin, though they ate it like a vegetable. And they probably did have cranberries because they were in cranberry country. I have a news flash. We almost lost Thanksgiving. It says here, Thanksgiving canceled. No football today. Don't really think that we had football at Thanksgiving. Um, this is one of my favorites. Here's Grandma here, Thanksgiving's canceled. She's got a can of hash. She's not looking very happy about it. <laughs> Didn't know that, did you? It's true. Way back when skirts were long and hats were tall, Thanksgiving was fading away. Sure, the folks up in New England celebrated it. Why, they'd roast a turkey and, and invite the relatives when the harvest came. But not in the South, not in the West, not even in the Middle Atlantic states. More and more, people ignored the holiday. Thanksgiving was in trouble. It needed a superhero. Oh no, not that kind of superhero. Thanksgiving needed a real superhero. Someone bold and brave and stubborn and smart. Thanksgiving needed Sarah Hale. Now I don't know what you're thinking. Uh, she doesn't look like a superhero. She looks like a dainty little woman. Never underestimate dainty little women. Sarah Hale was every inch a superhero. Not only did she fight for Thanksgiving, huh, hard upside down, she fought for playgrounds for kids. Imagine life without a playground. She fought for schools for girls because girls didn't go to school very much. And she fought for historical monuments. It doesn't tell the story here, but you know about the Washington Monument um, and the um, Bunker Hill Monument in Boston, the Washington Monument in, in uh, Washington, D.C.? Those monuments were started, but never finished. They were started by men, and then things got in the way. Sarah Hale undertook the job of raising money for the Bunker Hill Monument in Boston. She held a bazaar. A bazaar was like a yard sale or a church sale. And she and the ladies made things just like the ladies of the Gray Church. Uh, we had a, a sale last month or not very long ago. Um, and lots of the ladies baked things, and, and they made quilts, and they made holiday decorations. They made all kinds of things. And we also had a white elephant table. That was another of Sarah Hale's idea. Does anything you don't want that you think someone else can use, we'll, we'll sell it. Somehow we'll raise money, knitted mittens, whatever. And they had this giant bazaar. It was very successful. They raised a lot of money. And then the next year they had another one and raised a lot of money. And eventually Sarah Hale and her band of women raised the money to finish 
the Bunker Hill Monument. The men never talked about it much, but the women are the ones who did it. Sarah Hill argued against spanking. She also argued against pie for breakfast. Apparently my grandfather never listened to that one. <laughs> she argued against dull stories, corsets, things that the ladies wore that were laced tightly up the back and sometimes they'd hardly breathe. She argued against bloomers and bustles, things that you wore under your lawn dresses that were very inconvenient. And she argued against very serious things like slavery. As if that weren't enough, she raised her five children, she wrote poetry, children's books, novels, and biographies, and she was the first female editor in America. She published great American authors like Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, our main poet, and Edgar Allan Poe, and she composed Mary Had a Little Lamb. That that magazine that she edited was called Godey's Ladies Book, and I will show you one in a minute. How did she do all of these things? She was bold, brave, stubborn, and smart. I think you're stubborn made you a superhero. I could really be one. But I think you have to have all those other things with it. <laughs> and Sarah Hale had a secret weapon. Are you ready? Her pen. That probably doesn't look like your pen, but this was an old quill pen, and you dip the tip of it in ink. Probably some of you know, I suppose, I, I'm going to imagine if you've ever been up to the schoolhouse, um, uh, what am I going to call this schoolhouse? Dry Mills. Pardon? Dry Mills. Yeah, right, the Dry Mills schoolhouse that you probably see a quill pen up there. And Sarah went through a lot of quills and a lot of ink in her day. It's what she wrote with. When Sarah saw something she didn't like, she picked up her pen and wrote about it. She wrote letters. She wrote articles. She wrote and wrote and wrote until she persuaded people to make the world a better place. Nothing stopped Sarah. Sarah loved Thanksgiving. Remember, she was a New Englander, and New Englanders were the ones that mostly observed Thanksgiving as Thanksgiving went out of style in other places in the country. She wanted the whole country to celebrate it all on the same day. Then, if a state celebrated Thanksgiving, the governor had to say, well, we'll celebrate Thanksgiving in October this year, or on the first Tuesday, or whatever day they so chose. Sarah wanted it to be a national holiday. She wanted the day to be celebrated by everyone on the same day. She wrote letters, thousands and thousands of letters. She got her friends to write letters. They put down their babies, their hoes, their skillets, and their washing, and they picked up their pens and wrote. Politicians listened. One by one, the states made Thanksgiving a holiday, but that wasn't good enough. Sarah Hill wanted the whole country to celebrate together, like a family. And she went to the top. And where is the top? The president, of course. She wrote to the president himself, Zachary Taylor. He refused. Did that stop Sarah? No. She waited for the next election, and she wrote to President Millard Fillmore. He said no, too. But that didn't stop Sarah. She was bold, brave, stubborn, and smart. She wrote to the next president, Franklin Pierce, 
And Franklin Pierce was also a New Hampshire person. So Sarah was appealing to her fellow statesman, a New Hampshire president. Surely he would listen, but no. Then she penned an elegant letter to President James Buchanan. She gave all the reasons why America should be better off if everyone gathered on the fourth Thursday of November to give thanks. He disagreed. There he is disagreeing. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah felt as if the stuffing had been kicked out of her. Everything was going wrong. Now America was at war. You know about the Civil War when the north part of the United States and the south of the United States fought each other. The issue was slavery, which we already know Sarah was opposed. It was a terrible thing, countrymen against countrymen, and it upset Sarah deeply. And now, she wrote a letter to President Abraham Lincoln. She said, a holiday won't stop the war, but it could help bring the country together. The country was very divided, very much like it is today in, in many cases. And, and a lot of people are angry with a lot of other people. Could Thanksgiving help? Sarah signed the letter, folded it, and slid it into an envelope. She wrote Mr. Lincoln's name and address and stamped it. She mailed the letter and waited. And she waited. And she waited. And then she heard from Mr. Lincoln. Lincoln said, yes. Lincoln said, yes. Can you imagine what Mrs. Hale felt like after all these years? 33 years of writing to presidents. And finally, the great Mr. Lincoln said yes. In 1863, President Lincoln made Thanksgiving a national holiday. It was to be a day for all Americans to give thanks together. Thousands of letters, countless bottles of ink, but she did it. Nothing stopped Sarah, the bold, brave, stubborn, smart Sarah Hale. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah Hale did a lot of things other than just write uh, to President Lincoln. She um, we talked about the uh, Washington Monument and the Bazaar. She um, organized the wives of uh, sailors in Boston. And back at that time, um, in the early 1600s, um, 1800s, I'm sorry, uh, she um, found conditions for women to be absolutely terrible. When a sailor went to sea, he had to purchase his uniform. He had to purchase his uniform from the company for which he was going to work, the boat that he was going to sail on. But he had to buy it because it was too expensive for most people to buy all at once. So he had to buy it with payments. But the payments with interest were so much that the sailor really was unable to save any money or send it home to his wife. So wives and families suffered a great deal. They didn't get any or they got very little money home from their husbands. And working at the time, was not an option for most. Working conditions for women and children were deplorable. They, they were filthy, and, and those of you who are older have read about this. Um, they were dangerous, and, and 
Sarah Hale found that to be unacceptable. And so she organized the women. She had the Siemens Society of Boston. They made uniforms for the sailors and sold them at reasonable wages, much to the dismay of the original boat company uh, or ship company. Uh, they didn't like it and tried to stop them. And Sarah said, no, I'm sorry. We can make any uniform we want. We're going to make this one. And, and she, they did a lot of other sewing as well. She organized daycare centers. She organized uh, boarding houses for families and women where they could stay and be safe and didn't have to live in slums or on the street. Um, she was just a terrific organizer and a tremendous supporter of human rights and women's rights. Um, aside from Mary Had a Little Lamb, she wrote many other books editor of the National Women's Magazine. The book that I have right here that's very much falling apart and doesn't have the title visible anymore is a yearbook, a Godey's Ladies book in the year 1849. So that was a very long time ago. A yearbook is a collection of all the magazine issues that were published that year, all bound together in one book. Um, in the latest book, and I always found this interesting, um, pictures uh, and there goes part of the book, um, sketches and things always had this piece of tissue over them and it kept them from smudging or losing quality. And very famous parts of the ladies' book were fashion plates. So you could see the popular fashions of the day. So published sheet music mm -hmm. because ladies played most of them played the piano, many of them played the piano, and other instruments. So these were new songs, popular songs, that they could practice. But this book in 1849, I haven't lost my thing. In October 1849, there is a letter from Sarah Hale, who was the editor of the book and often wrote in it as well, often wrote stories or um, had a book review section. She wrote poems. In this particular book, and I would assume in any October issue of any magazine from 1840 to 1877, that's when she retired, um, you could find a similar plea. We must again remind our friends of this national festival. Sincerely do we hope and trust the cholera will leave our land before the time for this day of rejoicing. Rejoice in the abundance of gifts which the earth has produced for our people. If the last Tuesday, excuse me, if the last Thursday in November, falling this year on the 29th of the month, might be set apart that each and every governor of state and territory, what a glorious spectacle would be exhibited to the old world. Our great nation, by its states and families, from St. John's River to the Rio Grande, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, all gathered in a feast in which there would be abundance for all and where all might rejoice in peace and safety. Will not the editors of weekly and daily papers lend their aid to establish unity of time as well as design in this great festival, thus making it a national jubilee? So we celebrate Thanksgiving often as a celebration of the first Thanksgiving uh, in which 90 Indians and 60 pilgrims gathered after the first season 
to have their feast. Thanksgiving was celebrated in many countries um, as a feast after a harvest. You know, uh, not perhaps as national holidays, and in some countries, yes, as national holidays or religious holidays. But Sarah Hill's proposal was not necessarily to celebrate the first Thanksgiving. It was to bring people together in a divided country. It was specifically to gather to a feast in which there would be abundance for all and where all might rejoice in peace and safety. So remember that on Thanksgiving Day that we are all feasting together throughout this country as one people and we are enjoying the abundance that we have. And abundance means a lot of stuff, you know, um, a lot of squash. Well, that may not excite you so much, but a lot of pie. But we are doing so in peace and safety. And that was the intent of the Thanksgiving that Mrs. Hale convinced President Lincoln to decree. But it wasn't until 1941 that Congress actually made that permanent, long after Mrs. Hale's death. And now Thanksgiving is a permanent holiday and doesn't have to be decreed every year by a president or a governor. So happy Thanksgiving and enjoy Thanksgiving and enjoy your Mary's Had a Little Lamb end-ups. <laughs>